we're going to do here <clears throat> is to take a quick look at who should promote physical activity uh, within our society, why we should promote physical activity in our society, and how we can promote physical activity in our society. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Dr. Ruth Hunter, who will deal with the difficult part of it, which is the how. I'm just the lead in uh, to give you some of the background. <clears throat> The arguments for promoting physical activity are well rehearsed. There have been well over 30 years of very good research uh, to suggest that a more active society will benefit uh, from significant health improvements. So let me deal with this first. What is an active society? Well, the current chief medical officer recommends that every adult should accumulate 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week. Moderate intensity is an intensity that leaves you slightly breathless. In other words, a bit of a walk. Uh, not quite our usual Northern Ireland dander, uh, and uh, accumulated throughout the week, so integrated into everyday life. We've heard a lot of the benefits from regular participation in sport on mental health. We're going to take a slightly wider public health view on this and say that sport is a small part of a bigger physical activity picture, and that physical activity can be accrued from, yes, recreational activities or social activities, but it can also be accrued from modes of transport uh, and from our occupations. So why should we do it? <clears throat> well, the, the extensive health literature would suggest there are numerous benefits. Numerous benefits to our, our physical health, including reductions in the risk of heart disease, uh, of uh, obesity-related disorders like metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes, reduction in the risk of certain cancers uh, and uh, in, uh, in mental health conditions, and also improved functional, physical, and mental health. In other words, those who are active, at, irrespective of their time in their life, will benefit from increased cardiorespiratory, muscular fitness, uh, a better body composition, improved bone health, improved functional health, improved mental health. A strong argument. And within the health world, we make the argument that the costs of our inactive society currently cost the NHS about £1 billion per year. The story doesn't stop there, however. Because if we take the wider implications on society, then that cost radically goes up. So the, in, the impact of a, a physically inactive lifestyle leads to significant absenteeism from work, reduced productivity. There are also a number of societal problems uh, resulting from phys physical inactivity, and they may be around the areas of uh, crime uh, and social disorder and decreased social capital. So if we take some of those into account, uh, the best that we can, that number probably goes to about societal cost of our physically inactive lifestyles in the UK alone to be about £8 billion pounds per year. My first assertion to you, ladies and gentlemen, is physical activity is not a health problem. It is a societal problem and requires societal solutions. Therefore, irrespective of your government or non-government background, it is your responsibility to promote physical activity so that our society can benefit from some of these and other ways. We'll move on. So do we meet our 150 minutes? Well, in Northern Ireland, the uh, health survey for Northern Ireland suggests that about two-thirds of the Northern Ireland population fail to accrue that 150 minutes, that magic 150 minutes that has been shown time and again to lead to significant health benefits. The numbers reduce over time, so as we get older, our levels of activity go down. Uh, this uh, health survey only deals with, with uh, adults, but we can look at children's data, and the numbers start to decline at, in and about age 10 and 11, uh, whereby people of that sort of age are probably two-thirds are inactive as well. So this is a significant issue uh, within Northern Ireland, affecting a significant proportion of the population. However, it's also a global issue. World Health Organization have identified physical inactivity as the fourth leading cause of death worldwide. It makes a significant contribution to death in high, middle and low income countries, with the most rapid increases in physical activity in low income countries. Therefore, this isn't just a Northern Ireland problem. It is a global, it's been described as a global pandemic of physical inactivity. And therefore, I reassert my claim that this is a societal issue that we as societies, irrespective of the nature of our country, need to deal with urgently. Coming from a public health background, I read quite a lot of literature about the amount we spend on different diseases. Uh, and in, a, in a, a very substantial paper that was produced in a notable medical journal in 2012, uh, the authors, I think, wisely compared the impact of smoking and physical inactivity uh, on mor mortality. They asserted that uh, the levels of smoking uh, and inactivity were similar. Both contribute about 5 million uh, deaths per year globally. 5 million from smoking, 5 million from physical inactivity. 
and that's of about the 36 million deaths that can be attributed to chronic diseases worldwide. So they both have a similar contribution to mortality within our population. What's interesting is the prevalence of inactivity worldwide is much lower than in Northern Ireland, so the relative contribution is probably higher in our country. However, we only spend a fraction of our budgets promoting physical activity or providing opportunities for physical activity compared to smoking. And so I think we need to reassert our, our, our policy um, priorities towards away from some of the more traditional approaches in public health to what we are seeing as a strong evidence to promoting uh, and providing opportunities for physical activity. So the question remains is, well, why are we inactive? What, what can we do about it? So if we understand the reasons for inactivity, then we can begin to deal with some of those. And they're numerous. Usually we start off thinking about the individual barriers to regular physical activity. And no doubt there is a biological factor at play in here. Uh, Mr. Wells commented on the uh, relative contribution of genetics. Genetics probably contributes about 40% of the overall story in terms of mortality, and about 60% comes from behavioural patterns. So biology doesn't account for it all. Yes, the fitter we are, the more we can participate in some of the high-end activities. But it's not the only story. Probably the, wider, the more interesting story and the more relevant story is psychology. Knowledge of the benefits, knowledge of how much activity we should be doing, which is poorly, uh, which is poorly known in Northern Ireland. Attitudes to activity, uh, thinking that it's a good thing for me. Uh, uh, and also the social cultural factors, making activity, regular activity, a cultural norm. Mr. Wells gave a very nice example of an individual who chose to drive uh, the 20 or 30 feet between shops. And that is a cultural norm for us to drive between uh, venues here. But that's not the true in every country. And if you invi visit some certain uh, Northern European countries, you'll find that the norm is to take a more active mode to travel between places. So does tackling some of these individual factors work? <clears throat> in another review where they compared various approaches of tackling, of tackling physical activity to see how effective they might be. Now, the dotted line across the middle is the line of no effect. <clears throat> so if your intervention falls there, we usually say that's of, of no real benefit. You may not be able to see the details, but towards the left-hand side are more of the psychological interventions, tackling things like self-efficacy uh, or the belief that I am able to make changes in my activity and, and perform regular activity. And we see a reasonably relatively small effect size from those kinds of educational interventions or psychological interventions. Towards the right, you'll see the one that stands out uh, second from the right uh, is pedometers. This is a, a small device that attaches onto your waist and what you do is you ask someone to record their activity so you increase their awareness of how much they do and then to set goals. We have a long history of pedometer research in Northern Ireland that has been exemplified uh, throughout the world. And uh, we have shown that it is possible to get people to change their activity using pedometers over, over a period of time. And both universities have been involved in showing the health benefits of that. However, the effect sizes are probably still quite small. And I'd put to you the effect sizes are probably quite small because the individual factors that predict in the activity are only one side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is the environment in which we live. You see, as we assess the environment that we currently live in Northern Ireland, we can clearly see an over-reliance on cars. Our occupational uh, activity trends have changed where we're now reliant on computers and technology within work. And if we go into most uh, homes, where there's also a reliance on electronic entertainment for our um, recreational behaviours. So our transport has changed, our occupational activity has reduced, and our recreational opportunities have reduced. So what can we do about it? Well, let me introduce the concept of walkability. This came from a planning uh, perspective where planners went, there are actually features of where we live, the neighbourhoods in which we live, that can influence our physical activity. And they coined the term walkability. Walkability is, a, is a, a, a measure including a number of factors and let me outline one or two of them. One is which is residential density. Living in a higher residential density, people who live there are more active. Partly related to the ability to choose to go to places because they're usually places that have a high intersection density or connectivity of streets. So if you can imagine a classic suburban house in which many of us live at the end of a cul-de-sac, of which we have only one choice in the direction in which we might walk, which is out towards the main road, and most of us probably would choose not to walk along that main road. Com contrast that with an inner city, uh, say apartment block, which is high residential density, and we've got lots of choices of where we can go. When we come out of our front door, we can go left or right or straight or behind the building. So intersection density is, is, is uh, related to physical activity. 
And other factors like land use mix, the amount of the land apportioned to different uh, 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 types of de development, and also net retail area. So having shops and facilities and workplaces near our home mean we're more likely to travel to and from them. Let me convince you this from the data. People who live in more walkable neighbourhoods, and by walkable neighbourhoods, when we've assessed this in Belfast, are largely those inner city kind of neighbourhoods, the neighbourhoods that um, weren't planned by our modern planning service, in fact, uh, but that pre predate that. Uh, and that those who live there are more active, irrespective of social class, or in this case, income. Now, I didn't talk about inequalities in physical activity participation, but one of the big ones is, as we see in many health-related uh, behaviours, is in social deprivation. And so ir irrespective of income, living in a walkable neighbourhood uh, will improve your health. My second assertion to you, ladies and gentlemen, is not only would increasing physical activity benefit us across society and in, in our multi-sectors, but it is the responsibility of multi-sectors to deal with the growing pandemic of physical inactivity as it relates to Northern Ireland. This is not a health issue. Health do not have responsibility for planning, for building control, for road design. And, and so I would suggest that those, uh, that the other departments uh, who are be beginning to realise this need to take urgent action uh, on this. I quite like this uh, informative graphic from colleagues uh, in, uh, in San Diego in America uh, who've pulled together some of the evidence uh, and into a compelling argument. Living close to trails or facilities where you can walk or cycle mean that 50% of us are more likely to meet the physical activity guidelines. There's no education in there. That's merely just living close to the opportunity. But opportunity isn't the only thing because it has to be an opportunity that we may want to avail of. And therefore, walkable communities are twice as likely to meet their activity. Having recreational facilities that teens would want to use are probably also 50% more likely to meet their recommended level. We uh, were involved in a global um, uh, charter for physical activity, uh, which I'm sad to say our government hasn't signed up to. Uh, and part of this glo global uh, charter, Toronto Charter for Physical Activity, was five key things that governments would commit to to promoting physical activity. And I want to introduce three of them to reinforce my point. One is that we need to introduce policy that supports physical activity across multiple sectors. And I've just tried to highlight that from different examples so far. Number two is that we need to implement a national policy and action plan for physical activity. We have a number of uh, cross-sectoral, um, cross-departmental policies at the moment which relate to specific chronic diseases like obesity uh, and I know there are others in the pipeline. However, I would suggest that we need one particularly focusing on physical activity because it is not just a health issue but uh, much wider societal benefits can be accrued. And the only way to take forward an action plan that might uh, result from that um, national policy would be a partnership approach. So no longer, I think, is it acceptable for us to work in our silos and uh, transport and health uh, and um, DSD and others work in their own little bits of the country, uh, but that we should work together uh, because it's only through those cross-sectoral working that we can begin to initiate the interventions that are required to change these worrying levels of physical activity. That's the background, a little glimpse of what we've done in Northern Ireland. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Ruth Hunter, uh, who will describe some of the interventions that we are doing uh, in these areas. Okay, folks, so just to, to summarise really what we've heard so far, um, we know that physical activity levels in Northern Ireland are low and, and we need to do something to change that. We've also heard a, a summary of the evidence base that really highlights the many benefits of physical activity for health, uh, for society and also for economy. However, previous interventions have had only modest effects, with maintained changes in physical activity being difficult to achieve. We therefore need to rethink um, our approach to, to public health interventions if these physical activity recommendations are to be, to be realised. Um, so previous eff efforts um, have mainly targeted individual level factors associated with inactive lifestyles. Recent guidance published in January this year from NICE have highlighted three main components or behaviour change techniques um, that all um, interventions should include, uh, not just for physical activity, but also for other um, health behaviours. Um, these include self-monitoring and feedback. So as Mark went, mentioned, the likes of wearing a simple pedometer to measure a number of steps per day uh, and getting feedback on, on that on the amount that we're doing, also goal setting and, and also social support. So that includes our family, friends, work colleagues, and also, um, which is coming more into play now, online forums and social media. 
However, most of these inter individual level interventions are notable for their limited ability to sustain behaviours uh, beyond the actual time frame of the intervention. This may be because they actually omit to intervene in the actual social or physical environment context in which these behaviours occur. So we argue that there is a need to move beyond these individual level um, approaches towards broader population level behaviour change by providing both supportive social and physical environments. So research being conducted locally um, is aiming uh, to address these gaps in the evidence. So one example is some of the work that I've been leading in the development of a physical activity loyalty card scheme, so, which was piloted um, at Stormont Estate here with just over 400 civil servants. Um, so using a, a similar approach to well-known high street loyalty cards, where users can earn points for minutes of activity, and those points can then be um, reimbursed for rewards, which were retail vouchers sponsored by local businesses. So this individual level intervention was tailored to both uh, the local and social environment context. So for the, for the physical environment, sensors were placed, um, which is in the photograph here, around footpaths in the, in the gym uh, and exercise studio to record minutes of physical activity by simply swiping a little credit card, which was a loyalty card at these sensors, which recorded timestamps. Um, maps were also provided of local walking routes um, or where these sensors were placed, again, tailoring the, the physical activity behaviour to the workplace context. In terms of social support then, online forums were encouraged through our study website um, where participants could set up their, their own walking groups with colleagues. And from the, the, the swipe card data, we can infer social networks. So we've done some analysis looking at uh, the work colleagues who were walking with others. And from that analysis, uh, we can see that people who actually tend to walk in groups of, of two or more actually stayed longer in the intervention and completed more minutes of activity than those who tended to walk alone. So social support is, is important. Another unique aspect of this, um, of this study was that the retail vouchers were sponsored by local businesses. Um, for financial incentive schemes such as this to be worthwhile in the, in the longer term and also to be implemented on a, on a large scale, they must be based on a sustainable business model. The ready buy-in of retail partners in our study suggests that such a, a model um, is achievable and such schemes can actually have a win-win for both public health and also for, for local businesses. So from a public health term in terms of increasing employees' health, um, physical activity levels, improving their health and well-being, uh, reduced absenteeism and also increased productivity. And also for local businesses by increasing foot, footfall and number of customers back to those businesses when participants redeem, uh, redeem their vouchers. So as Mark alluded to earlier, um, the potential of the built environment to influence population levels of physical activity is huge. And this has been recognised by a number of reports from the World Health Organisation, UK Foresight Report and also NICE, which has led to an upsurge of research activity in this area. However, however there is a dearth of evidence regarding the impact of urban regeneration on public health. Again, uh, research being conducted locally is seeking to address this gap in the evidence. So the Conswater Community Greenway is a 30, £32 million urban regeneration project that's currently being developed in East Belfast. So if any of you had driven up the Sydney Bypass today and passed the city airport, you would have seen uh, the construction that's currently taking place at Victoria Park and also Orangefield Park. Um, so this includes the development of a nine kilometre linear park. It's also about improving the accessibility of the area in terms of connecting up 124 hectares of open and green space. There's also provision of new, new and improved bridges, foot and cycle paths, cleaning up the three main rivers in the area, so the Conswater, Knock and Loop River, to make them an asset of the area, and the provision of tourism and heritage trails and a new civic centre at Hollywood Arches. So it's really creating a, a purpose-built environment to, in order to encourage people to be more active. So the park study, which stands for physical activity and the, the regeneration of Conswater, is a large natural experiment that's being led by Professor Frank Key in the C Centre for Public Health at Queen's University that both myself, Mark uh, and Lindsay are involved in. Um, the main aim uh, of this project is to determine the role of the built environment um, in promoting physical activity, to also establish the role of individual community and organisational networks, so again tapping into that, the social environment context and to examine the cost effectiveness of these approaches. The main components of this study are a before and after household survey with just over 1,200 uh, local residents. So this has been completed before construction um, 
started. And we'll repeat this again in late 2015, 2016, whenever construction of the Greenway is complete. There's also a detailed network and social capital analysis in order to capture the, the social environment context associated with physical activity behaviour change, a process evaluation that captures detailed geographical information or GIS systems data to, to capture the, the built environment influence of behaviour change and also economic and behavioural economic analysis. So we've done some uh, preliminary analysis to look at the potential uh, cost effectiveness of the likes of the Conswater Community Greenway using modelling techniques. So we modelled the potential impact of the Greenway on uh, burden from various chronic diseases, so colon and breast cancer, ischemic heart disease, type 2 diabetes and stroke. The bars in the chart uh, relate to if 2, 5 and 10% of the local population shift from being inactive to being active, i.e. if they move to uh, actually completing at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week. We found that then incidents uh, of cases and number of deaths from these various chronic uh, conditions uh, can be prevented. Results also show that even if 2% of the population become active, then the Greenway is cost effective and in essence pays for itself. Although direct health gains are predicted to be small for any individual, summed over an entire population, they are substantial. It's also worth noting that um, as well as health benefits, the Greenways, um, there are other potential benefits in terms of reduced carbon emissions, improvements in safety and also less crime. But um, built environment interventions don't have to happen at such scale uh, to show improvements. So I just wanted to briefly highlight uh, a project that took place uh, in Philadelphia in America. Um, where, which undertook a, a scheme really to green and improve vacant lots. So this was involved things like clearing rubbish and debris from the area, um, cutting grass and, and, and uh, planting trees. Uh, and this resulted in reductions in gun assaults and vandalism, but also re residents reporting less stress and also more exercise. So again, showing the potential of the built environment, improvements in the built environment to increase our, our health, health and wellbeing. So just in conclusion, um, physical activity is a major public health concern with implications for health, society and the economy. However, previous interventions have had at best only modest short-term effects. There is therefore a need for more novel interventions. Um, we need to move beyond individual level approaches towards broad, broader population uh, level interventions that provide both a supportive physical and social environment. In order to facilitate this shift, uh, physical activity must be integrated into cross de departmental strategies and as well uh, there is a need for a national strategy that has physical activity as its priority. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.